Hi, everybody. Meredith Baker for On the Map, Off the Radar. And we have a very special episode today. We're actually here with my former Harvard professor, Caroline Elkins, who uh, wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book, Imperial Reckoning, um, the story of the British Gulag in Kenya about the um, torture of Kenyans under British colonial rule. And in 2009 through 2013, cases were raised with Kenyan elderly um, people who had been tortured by Britain about getting reparations um, for the British treatment of Kenyans during the colonial Kenyan period. And so Professor Elkins is going to talk to us a little bit about the case that she worked on, her role in the case, and how resurfacing these documents that the British government had tried for half a century to cover up has kind of rewritten history in a way. So Professor Elkins, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I know you're incredibly busy. My pleasure, Meredith. What, what a treat for me, actually. <laughs> Thank you. And can you explain the role that you played in the recent case with the Kenyan elderly raising um, this case against the British government uh, for how they were treated during the British colonial rule in Kenya? Sure, and absolutely. You played a role in this as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the case was, as you mentioned, brought up in uh, the spring of 2009, and it was based upon the, the, the particulars of the claim were very much based upon my research and findings that were in Imperial Reckoning. And so prior to the case being filed, I was asked by the uh, claimant's attorneys, Lee Day, who were based in London, and the Kenyan Human Rights Commission based in Nairobi, if I would be willing to serve as the expert witness for the case, because clearly they needed not just the book, but all the expert uh, historical expertise with revisionist findings behind uh, the book itself. And, and um, obviously that proved quite instrumental because as I learned as the case evolved, that this was really very much a case of history on trial. Um, and really trying the merits, if you will, of revisionist history, in this case, very much a revisionist history about the nature of colonial violence, the ways in which it was condoned and systematized by the British colonial state, the ways in which that same state tried to cover up um, its crimes in the aftermath, and particularly during the time, and then in the aftermath of decolonization. Um, and then ultimately the ways in which my own findings really sort of came against the, um, you know, really rubbed against, if you will, sort of what are considered to be the normatives about thinking how people think about the British Empire, right? And so it was in many ways about these five claimants and also really an opportunity within the court of law to sort of shift the way in which the public thinks about empire and the impact that it had on the lived experiences of the colonized. And can you go into... Um, a little bit about the watch and legacy system that you found mm -hmm. in some of these documents that you unearthed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, the, the question you asked really touches upon a very important point um, in the case, and I think it demonstrates the ways in which history and law intersect around the question of archives, right? So one of the big stumbling blocks that I had when I was writing my book <clears throat> was the fact that it was very, very apparent that just massive amounts of files were missing, right? And one can deduce rather fairly logically as an historian that these were in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not more, entire departments like the police department were just missing. Well, if you fast forward to the case, and so that book was done in 2005, and if you fast forward to the case that began in 2009, we began, um, as most cases would, asking for documents from the opposing side, in this case, the British government. And what happened was, is that the British government consistently came back for the first year or so saying, we have nothing more, everything's in the archives, nothing, nothing here more to give you. Well, um, then in sort of late December 2010, early 2011, there's, which never happens in the high court, right, sort of an emergency hearing, your honorable, venerable sir, the most incredible things just happened. We've just discovered, you know, 800, you know 300 boxes of previously undisclosed files, um, all located in the basement of Spook Central, which is Hanslope Park, where they keep all their MI5 and MI6 files. And the reason I'm telling you all this, Meredith, is it gets to the question of watch and legacy files. Buried in all these documents were, and were incredibly interesting to me as a historian who'd been working on this topic for years, were the first documents documenting the document destruction that took place in the final days of British colonial rule, not just in Kenya, but in many, many other colonies in the former British Empire. In other words, 
getting rid of documents was part of the process of decolonization. So systematized violence on documents, just like on bodies and minds in detention camps. And the Watcher legacy comes up because part of the process that we learn from these new documents is that in a very highly choreographed way, by order of the colonial office in London, the Kenyan government had all of their major ministers and, and various colonial administrators, and they had a rubber hand stamp with a W on it. And for every file, and they had to go through every single file and every, every single account, and hand stamp with a W, any file that was to be called a watch file. In other words, it was either going to go into the, into the, the infernos and be burned, or it was going to be boxed up and brought back to the UK. And then anything that was considered a legacy, and what one of the watch files was anything that was embarrassing to the British government, might compromise the British government, all the things that you might consider to be sensitive. Anything that was legacy was anything that could be handed over to the new independent government without any, without any concern, right? And so ultimately, the first time we actually ever saw a document with a hand-stamped W on it, you think about this, millions of pages had been hand-stamped, was in the context of this Mau Mau case with the new files. None of these exist in any archives prior to that. And on top of which, what we learned is that about three and a half tons of documents with those W hand stamps were burned prior to the end, prior to the British decolonization. So we have a real sense now for the first time of how carefully the British government managed its legacy and how history was going to remember empire, not just in Kenya, as I said, but also in multiple other colonies throughout the British empire. Right, because it was really romanticized as the sun never sets on the British Empire and really, especially in like a lot of history classes in England, this rosy idea of what the British Empire stood for, whereas the British were completely shaping the empire in the way in which they wanted it to be perceived by the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Which kind of leads me to the next thing, as you and I had previously touched on, one of the past on the map, off the radar episodes was about the Rhodes Must Fall movement and institutionalized racism. So how does something like this bringing up, unearthing all of these documents um, that kind of reveal a past that had been since hidden, reshape the way that we think about this uh, period in history? And do you think that you'll, that there will be changes in the education system too when discussing the colonial empire? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, the, listen, I think the insofar, and I, I'm an historian, right? And, and I also believe perhaps unlike, not, I don't want to say unlike, but many historians are sort of looking at the past in a way of trying to understand a particular moment in time and perhaps less attached to the role that history plays in contemporary circumstances. And for my own self, since wars have been fought over history. Politics is history. And I think in this case, uh, you know, I'd point to a couple factors. Number one, on the British side, there was clearly a very carefully managed and choreographed <coughs> way, <coughs> pardon me, in which the British Empire and its legacy was supposed to be remembered and celebrated <coughs> in the context of Britain and the former empire, now the Commonwealth. Insofar as in doing that, <coughs> what it did is it denied to many people, in this case Kenyans, rightful knowledge about their own past, the ways in which individuals struggle, the ways in which they suffer, the ways in which the British portrayed them to be, um, individuals who in best case scenario had faulty memories and worst case scenario liars, that all this, all this account for, for years and even during the context of the court case, that these claimants, not just the claimants, but also an extension, Kikuyu and Kenyans in general, were making all this up. This was fictionalized. So in my own view, when we get back to institutionalized racism, providing individuals with access to the if you will, truth, and uh, you know, we have to be careful about truth claims, but um, to a balanced at a minimum um, understanding of what their own history is, to a balanced understanding of the, to be very unequivocal crimes, war crimes that were committed by the British government, um, not just in Kenya, but elsewhere, understanding what it's like and what it means for nations to be born in cauldrons of violence and what that has and the implications that has in the post-colonial world. All of these things must be bequeathed to future generations. And when one imagines the ways in which race is institutionalized in the very fabric of what it means to be British based upon 
on a sense of getting empire right, that they were somehow more gently and courtly and, and, and how to transfer a power that was different from the French and the Americans and so on and so forth, of course, is all nonsense. So myths perpetuate institutionalized racism. And so one of my goals has been to, from an historian standpoint, to really look at the past in a very clinical methodological way and understand what is myth and what is not, and try to bring that not just to the attention of the academy, but most importantly, to the outside world, to the lived experiences of men and women who are living in Africa today. And um, as a final question, um, while you were writing the book and also during the trial, were there ways in which mainstream media um, obscured what, um, what was going on with the case? Yeah, you know, listen, I think that we see, as, as all things, we saw, saw evolution from the time the book was published until sort of the case and, and through the case itself. At the time that the initial publishing of the book um, in 2005, it was a very tricky time because it was a moment when um, Britain was going to war with the U.S. and Iraq. Um, and here sort of a young American woman comes along and there's a great deal of backlash about that in the UK, particularly on the left. And so somebody comes along and says, well, actually, you know, you're not, you, you know, your empire wasn't a whole lot different from what's going on, right? And, every, and many people would read Imperial Reckoning and think that, oh, it's really about Iraq, it's really about Afghanistan. Of course it wasn't, it was very much about Kenya. It was about the ways in which counterinsurgency and violence perpetuate themselves. Um, and so it very much touched a raw nerve. I mean, the right was predictable, right? Elkins is crazy. She's made this up. This is fiction. I mean, I really was given a very, very hard time um, by the right and still am. Um, but also on the left, it touched a nerve, and I think a nerve that surprised everybody. And, 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 but I think the important thing is, as time went on, and particularly in the context of the case, I would not underestimate two things. One, the role that particularly The Guardian, Ian Cobain, and others played in keeping this story in the mainstream press, right? And the reporting that was done, um, not necessarily by the Guardian, but by some of those, sure, they got some things that were off and wrong, but for the most part, they covered the story very, very well and played, I think, a very important role in public pressure on the British government coming to the bargaining table and settling this case in 2013 when they had vowed from the very beginning that they would never settle this case, that it was gonna, they were going to fight it to the end. I think the other thing that's very interesting in this, and perhaps a good point to end on, one thing that historians will get as much in documents and voices is also silences. And the very interesting thing about the right-wing press that had sort of eviscerated me when I first came out with these findings in 2005, you know that, you know, for the most part, you heard from the right deafening silence, just nothing, right? And I think in that sense, um, when we get back to sort of shifts in how people think, uh, we go from, you know, sort of some of the very virulent critique of the book to having absolutely nothing to say whatsoever, which suggests, you know, there's a lot, as I said, to be read in the silence about the British Empire. And I think that's the point at which we're at. And we're going to beginning, I think, as more and more research is done, and as more and more Africans in this case, or former colonized populations know more about their own histories, that's when we're going to be seeing the shift in the narrative um, in the years ahead. Well, thank you so much for such an incredible interview. And this definitely speaks to the importance of kind of looking at history with a critical eye and seeing the relevance of um, studying history and the implications it can have today, especially when you unearth all of these new findings. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And I will include a link to your book and more information below the YouTube video. This has been On the Map, Off the Radar.